uh, southwest Minnesota in Murray County on my wife's family farm. There's about 220 acres here. Most of it's in CRP. My wife's family has owned this property since about 1900. My wife and I have lived out here approximately 16 years. Most of the property was put into the Conservation Reserve Program because the land is not really all that suitable for road crop production. It's pretty rocky and there's some sandy areas. And so we thought, you know, with our conservation-minded family that we thought it'd be better suited to put it into a conservation reserve program. And, and we like to hunt, and we like to fish, and so we use it quite a bit for recreational purposes. This land first went into CRP, I believe, in 1999. So it's been in there for a little over 20 years. We brought the sheep in here as a result of COVID of all things. This area was set to get burned this past spring, but because of the COVID, we couldn't get people that would come out and help us do a prescribed burn here. And so we were looking for alternatives and, and Chris Schmidt, our renter, was asking, well, maybe I could graze that area and we'd have the same kind of benefits. And so we investigated that with FSA and NRCS and they said, yeah, let's try that. And we wanted to replicate what the bison did on the prairies prior to European settlement, where they would come in and flash graze it and stomp it down. And that rejuvenates the prairie grasses and, and the flowers. And so we thought, Rather than having to go and burn and get a whole bunch of people together, if Chris could use his sheep to achieve the same results, that's a win-win for us and him. Um, this particular piece that we're grazing now is like 40 acres. There's about a little over 100 head of ewes that we have in here right now. We got in two different paddocks, separated on age groups and maturity, and trying to keep them separate for our breeding program. We're rolling up the net here. We've just laid it down and uh, rolling it up so we can move it to the next paddock. It's why we kind of like the nets is because they're very mobile. We can come in and graze an area and pull up the nets and not even leave a trace, really. It's kind of handy. So we're gonna grab the roller and then we're gonna lay the grass down so we can lay the nets up better. So what Dad's doing now, he's just rolling that grass down. And it's not so bad in this height of grass, but when you get in some of that blue stem that can be six feet tall, it's hard to lay these nets down without having a lot of trouble. And what we're finding is, even though we roll it down with that roller, the grass pops right back up within a few days. You know, unless it's really tall, then it just crimps it. But, and that's not all bad either. Keeping that grass folding down and keep the whole process for the biology. So this is way more labor intensive than, than doing like cattle, you know, where you're running just a single wire poly. You know, that's why we set up the paddocks. Obviously we're looking at the forage, how much do we have here? We don't want to get greedy. We don't want to take too much. We got to look at the forage and go, all right, we, this, this particular group, there's 34 head in here. We're still going to set up a paddock that's about seven tenths of an acre. So that way, we can maybe leave them here for three, four days, and they're still not gonna overgraze. I mean, that's what it looks like they were there for four days. You, you can barely even tell. So the other group, there's more in there. So we gotta watch that group a little bit closer on how long we leave them there because it's the same size paddock, but it's more animal, more animal impact. You know, if we're taking more than half of what's here, then we've overgrazed it. You know, we can't get greedy on the grazing. I think that's what causes a lot of problems, not only in pasture land, but even the farm ground. We get greedy with what we're trying to take off the ground when we're messing up the biology and the microbes and, and the whole process. We're finding if we take half, leave half, or you know, even leave a little bit more, the regrowth is phenomenal. And we've done that so many times on other pastures, and we've seen that in our solar field project. We just keep moving, keep them moving, you know, em emulate the wildlife that was here before us. The buffalo, they, they came through and they grazed right on through. They didn't stay, because if they stayed, then they started getting health problems. And that's what we find with our sheep. If we don't keep moving them, pretty soon you get parasitic worms, and that's Mother's Nature's way of saying, hey, we're overstocked here, we need to thin out the herd. So if we keep them moving, we get a lot less problems. And this part of the operation, that you know, we try and leave the 
side by side real close to the end of the net. The nets are about 165 feet long, so usually dad is really, really, really close about stopping where he needs to, which helps a lot. It kind of reduces the amount of walking we got to do. Well, dad did good driving. We weren't short. So we'll kind of watch and see how hard they hit this hill here. And I think next spring we'll probably see a pretty good regrowth in these paddock areas just from getting the animal impact on them. Since we've already grazed this, if I run them back into this paddock, they're going to think that's where they should be. And we don't want them here anymore. So we're probably going to set up another net just as an alleyway, just to get them over to where we want them. And then next time they'll just hop right over here. It takes some time to get them to learn how to, to move, but once they figure out that when they're gonna get moved every three, four days and they're going to fresh grass, they know what's going on. It's all training. Sometimes it takes a little while to get them trained. My more mature ewes, I don't even really have to do anything anymore. They see us come out, start setting up the nets. They're walking along the pen that they're in, waiting for me to open it up. Some of the younger ones are a little more rambunctious but they know what's going on they just sometimes want to play a little bit more than just run into where they should go but once they know what what's going on it it helps and sometimes we'll run some older ewes with younger ones to teach the younger ones how to do that and we started doing some pasture lambing now in the spring so the mothers and babies are getting trained at the same time so now if we keep those ewe lambs back for replacements they were born in that system and they know that they get moved from when they're little and that's starting to help too with their training. It doesn't take quite as long because they already know what's going on from birth. And so we're, we're moving them about every three to four days. And that all depends upon the forage, the height of it. You know, we can leave them maybe an extra day if they haven't eaten everything that you want them to eat of forage. Now they're going to trample some down, which is good. That's not bad either. But once it starts dying down a little more, we may have to move them every two days or give them a little bit more paddock area. You just gotta kinda watch, and you get a feel for that as you start doing this more and more. You'll start to see the regrowth. Some of this that we've done the first paddock, there's probably eight, 10 inch regrowth on some of that grass already. This is the first paddock that we turned the sheep out when we started this project, August 17th. So pretty much one month ago. The very first paddock, this is the regrowth we already got coming back. We're in September and it's still regenerating. It's still coming back. The way we moved the sheep today was pretty simple. It takes them, I'll say, about three times of moving. When you move them, when you start doing the paddocks in the spring, you have to plan your day around what you're gonna do every day or every third day. But if you can get food like this, rather than hay them, it, it makes the world a difference to us. We just, you, it's an old packer that you used to pull behind a drill when you drilled small grain. We just took a section of that and it works great just to lay the grass down so it don't short out the wire and the fencer. We moved two different groups of sheep today and I, I'd say it took us about an hour and a half by the time we tore down fence, set up fence and got them moved and fencer and hooked back up. I think it's about an hour and a half per paddock or per group of sheep. We water the sheep, we took an old trailer and just use the running gear and put a pallet on it and a water barrel and just come around it's got a spigot on it and we just run a pipe and move our barrels every three days and we check them every day and if they need water we water them if they don't they don't get water but otherwise we come out and check for water. Dad is a great asset moving the nets it takes time and for him to help run the side by side and, and roll the grass down and help stand up the fence and drive ahead and it just speeds things up quite a bit. Setting up the electric netting is a little more labor intensive than a cattle operation with the poly wire and, and setting that up. But on the flip side, we are getting a good forage crop, keeping the animals healthy. They're out in fresh air. This time of year, normally we would have to take those animals back to our dry lots, start feeding them hay. You know, for us, this is helping with the amount of hay that we have to feed in the yard. Well, hopefully we can keep them here depending upon the weather. You know, we have 120 days that we can potentially graze here. From a financial aspect, that saves us a lot on our, our hay that we have to feed. Now, there is some cost with the netting, but that's not a one-time cost. That netting we should be able to use for 10 to 15 years. The financial incentive, on the, there was some on the nets, and that was through our water quality certification. 
And so once we got that certification, there is grant funds available for doing projects that are for water quality. And rotational grazing is part of that water quality. So I filled out the paperwork and stuff and did the whole process, you know, and went through that. And, and there's a cost share on the netting, which helped pay for a lot of this netting and the solar fencers. We love the nets. We use solar fencers so we can be portable with them. We can go anywhere we want with them. Uh, the nice thing about it is we can run a paddock, we roll up the nets, and you don't even know we've been here other than you can see it's been grazed. So there's no long-term effect, you know, as far as a, a permanent fence or anything like that. Working with the NRCS laying out this grazing plan was, was good. I think it was a good learning experience for both of us. Once we got on the same page, everything went smooth. This particular project, Chris came into my office, I want to say probably in February of this year, and said that this opportunity came up where they can look at doing some rotational grazing out on CRP, which is very out of the normal. CRP, the program, is typically limited to emergency haying and grazing and not a full season grazing. And this isn't even a full season, it's been truncated, but this is a good trial to see what's working, what's not working. So this is a fantastic opportunity to get something new rolling out here on CRP and incorporating the livestock component. This is a farm service agency policy driven program. So FSA makes the policies on it that say when and where and how long you could graze. So basically if we have a drought or maybe even like last year where we get a little too much water and the livestock need to have some forage, the grasslands, they'll open up the CRP for emergency haying and grazing. This is the first time that we have even ventured into this type of a grazing practice under CRP. So this is pretty exciting. The forage that is here above ground, you have just as much, if not more, going on below ground. And that's where our soil health component is happening. And if you have healthy soil down below, you're going to have healthier plants. They're gonna rebound better. They're going to be able to withstand a lot of the variation in your weather patterns. They're going to be able to produce the forage for the livestock at a much quicker pace. So a few of the major benefits of having livestock out here is if you take a look at the ground, you can see where they trample it down and someone passing by might say, well, they waste that. However, you're looking at this as ground cover. It's protecting it from the hot sun. So in the hot August, July weather, this is giving it shade. So the soil is not being baked and you're not killing off the organisms that are in the soil. So that's one major benefit. Also, by laying a cover, it protects it from the heavy raindrops or the wind. The livestock obviously will leave manure behind, and even though manure is a waste, there is major benefit in that for the plants and other organisms that are already here. Another great benefit of having livestock out here on grass is the fact that the grass acts like a filtration system. Say if you were to have livestock on concrete and it rains, that manure is gonna wash off of that concrete a lot quicker and potentially provide pollution. Where if it's out here, the manure is getting soaked into the ground so the nutrients are staying much more localized. So it's definitely more environmentally friendly to have livestock out here depositing the manure out here. It also saves on time and equipment expense for the producers. They don't have to pick up the manure and haul it to bring it out of the feedlot area. The animals are depositing it and spreading it out on their own. Megan with Pheasants Forever, she's been out here handling quite a bit of the plant counts, the plant stands, what's happening with the actual species that are present, what are the animals choosing to eat, what are the animals not choosing to eat, Pheasants Forever is a really nice entity to partner with. They have a lot of similar goals in mind and they're very heavy into the wildlife aspect. So it's an amazing partnership to have them here to add that component to this. I worked with Chris on a couple of different projects and he's doing a lot of neat things. He was uh, looking for some more acres for his sheep to graze and around here that is quite hard to come by and I work on CRP 
So um, they just opened up CRP for grazing and haying and it turned out to be a really good solution for what Chris had going as well as Wendy and Jim had just missed two years of prescribed fire which they usually do to manage their CRP and it had just been too wet and they couldn't get it done so uh, the opening of grazing on CRP ended up working out perfect timing for both Chris and for the landowners. This was all planted in 99 to uh, prairie grasses, uh, big blue stem, Indian grass. Then more recently, we interseeded this area with forbs, prairie flowers and stuff. And that was done to promote pollinators and just a better diversity of grasses for wildlife habitat purposes. So I came out here uh, before we introduced the sheep to the landscape and did some um, plant counts. Uh, there's a ton of big blue stem, little blue stem, side oats, grama, wild bergamot, various sunflower species, asters, goldenrod. It's a great variety of native species for the sheep to graze on and having that diversity on the landscape is very important for wildlife. Even if you think of the pollinators, it's going to be a very big benefit to them to get these sheep out here because they will open up the litter layer and hopefully get some sunlight down to the ground and that'll spark diversity in the native forbs and grasses. We do a lot of pheasant hunting and duck hunting. Uh, we get a lot of deer out here. I've seen badgers out here, which are pretty rare in this part of the world, it seems like. Songbirds, hummingbirds, we get a lot of butterflies, bees, waterfowl nest out in here. and We see ducks landing out in the middle of the CRP in the summertime. We know they're going in there and nesting, and it provides a lot of habitat for wildlife. I live right by here. Every time I drive by, there's brood after brood all along the highway there. As soon as I come by, they're crawling back into this. So it's definitely uh, gonna hold a lot of birds. Not to mention that we have Lake Mariah just over to the west of us. And that is a big contiguous area of grassland. So this is a pretty loaded area for pheasants. I think it's important to incorporate grazing, whether it be sheep or cattle on CRP lands, because when you look back to before conventional agriculture. Historically, fires used to run through southwest Minnesota every two to three years, and then there would be grazing as well. And if you eliminate one of those components, the grasses are managed in only one fashion. For instance, fire is going to stimulate a ton of growth, but it may um, benefit grasses more than forbs. And Grazing does different things for native grasses and native stands than fire does, so having both options I think is very important. Fire um, will take all the nutrients that you see around us and turn it into ash so the ground can take up all those nutrients and makes it readily available. Whereas grazing, they're grazing down to a certain point, they may not be getting the litter layer, but they're opening up all these little areas for the seed bank that sits in there, even though you may not see it now, once they're done grazing, new species will be popping through because they've been able to get sunlight and they have less competition because the sheep have come through here and grazed all the more dominant species of grasses and forbs. It gives the stand more diversity, which is super important for wildlife, pollinators, and for the native grass and forb stands. You know, we have the milkweed out here, and that's really good for the monarchs, you know, and that's the main source of their uh, food and how they nest, from what I understand. And so we have that growing throughout all of our CRP areas, and we really like to see it because we get a lot of the monarchs migrating through here about this time of the year. The growing season is only so long in Minnesota. I think if you could spread this out throughout the year, it would be better both for the quality of the plant for the sheep and you get that disturbance which promotes sunlight getting to the ground surface that gets the other plants opportunity to grow because of the tall grass that we have out here that sometimes shades out the ground and if it gives some opening where bugs will be available for the nesting birds or I should say the young of the year that they can go and catch those bugs and eat them because that's their main source as chicks for pheasants are bugs that's their protein source and so we look at it as you want a mix of open 
areas and tall areas for cover for the young of the year, and so it's a win-win. People were worried about the sheep disturbing nesting birds, and we found that, you know, that it really isn't going to disturb them any more than the bison disturbed nesting ducks or songbirds in the prairie prior to European settlement. And so we're thinking this would be a win-win for everybody if we could do this type of management. As long as landowners follow the prescribed number of animal units on the, the area, it's just replicating what na nature did prior to European settlement. We're trying to mimic nature, so when you had the buffalo coming across here, you had thousands of them. That hoof action gets the microbes going, and obviously their droppings and urination, I mean, that's a lot of fertilizer right there, and it's not highly concentrated, spread out. We've seen on our soil tests increased biology and in our soil health so much. And it's not going to be any different here, whether it's grassland or cropland. This is just the tip of the iceberg for us. And we're going to come back here in the spring, we're going to pull some soil samples, we're going to send them in, see you know, what happened. Good, bad, or ugly, we want to know. You know. We have an idea of what's going to happen, what it's going to look like, a pretty good idea, but then we'll get it in on paper. We won't see this CRP field for grazing for three years. If we keep running them on the same pasture year after year after year, the same time, we start to get a parasitic worm problem. We have a, a long-term plan here, so they've got another area next year we're going to graze on their CRP and, and then the year after, and so we'll be back here on this one in three years again. We are helping this soil. Just because it's in CRP doesn't mean it, it's healthy. We've pulled soil tests on CRP. We know just a quarter mile away what the organic matter was on CRP, and our cropland that we do cover crops on has a higher organic matter than what was left in CRP for 15 years. And we had that animal impact on that particular piece of ground. So for us to do the testing on here to find out how we're increasing our organic matter, the microbiology, the whole system, I think with the sheep impact on here, we'll get a good start of what it can look like. Maybe next time we can put some cattle out here and see what that does. What we want to look at here is to make sure that this is the right way to do it. And we want to tinker with the number of animal units you put out on the property to see that we're doing a good enough job, we're getting enough disturbance. It's like anything else in life. There's a fine line between not enough action to get the disturbance and the response of the grasses and the pollinators and the pheasant, whatever, versus too many where it's grazed down to nothing and it doesn't provide the right amount of habitat. And so we will be looking at this cooperative with Pheasants Forever and NRCS to look at was this the right number of animal units that we had out here and we'll tinker with that for next year. That's our goal is a follow-up, you know, working with Chris saying, yeah, you know, was that enough property for you to get what you needed for your sheep and for us, as landowners, is this the best use of this property? The sheep being on the CRP land is, has been very successful for us as far as economics. It's, it helps a lot. This was a prescribed burn, so this would have been burned this spring. It all would have went up in smoke. So it was, it's a lot of feed that we've been able to use that would not have been able to be used. I really do hope that he is able to do this pilot program for at least another couple of years. I really believe that having the livestock on here I think is a great way instead of having just prescribed burning as an option or just clipping as an option. When I look across this 40 acres or so of CRP and what Chris has done with his rotational grazing with his sheep, I really think this is a very successful movement towards a very positive ending result. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how everything plays out for this.